Assalamu alaikum. Namaskar. I extend my warm and personal greetings to Her Excellency, Ms. Sheikh Hasina, the distinguished Honorable Prime Minister of Bangladesh, to Justice Obedul Hassan, Honorable Chief Justice of Bangladesh, my own very distinguished colleagues, Justice Aniruddha Bos, Justice Deepankar Datta, Justice Somen Sen, Justice Arijit Banerjee, to Mr. Justice M. Inayatul Rahim, Honorable Judge of the Appellate Division of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh, Mr. Anisul Haq, Minister of Law, Justice and Parliamentary Affairs, to the High Commissioner for India, Sri Pranay Verma, who has very graciously been present throughout my trip here, to all the judges from across courts in India and Bangladesh, distinguished guests. Y yesterday, my spouse and I offered our humble tribute at the memorial of the father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. As I said yesterday morning at the inaugural, this was personally an emotional moment for me because I represent a generation of India which was just growing up when the liberation of Bangladesh took place. So in that sense, emotionally, my generation, and I dare say the entire part of our country, entire country, shares a bond of friendship, not just in terms of culture and history, our social ties, but in terms of the histories which our countries have faced. The memorial to the father of the nation is a poignant, if even a stark reminder, that freedom has come with complete and absolute sacrifice by the father of the nation and his family. Yet, as you reflect on what happened at that time, and you reflect on Bangladesh as she stands today, one is struck by the remarkable, remarkable progress made by Bangladesh under the stewardship of the Honorable Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina Ji, on social indicators of growth and progress, whether it is in terms of the reduction of poverty, the increase in income levels, reduction of infant mortality, the absolute reduction in maternal mortality, the growth of GDP even through years of COVID which shocked the entire world. I think the examples and experiences of Bangladesh and India provide a clear indicator that democracy and the rule of law are consistent with bringing about an economic and social transformation in our societies. And coming here to Bangladesh, and I returned after a very long period of time, is a clear reflection of the progress which has been achieved by Bangladesh and India following institutional growth, commitment to democracy, commitment to constitutionalism and the rule of law. And with that, I offer my sincere tribute to the father of the nation and to the work which has been carried on by the government in Bangladesh under the able guidance of the Honorable Prime Minister. As we draw the curtains on this two-day conference on South Asian constitutional courts in the 21st century, lessons from Bangladesh and India, I congratulate the Supreme Court of Bangladesh for the initiative and industry in putting together this conference, particularly my very dear brother, Chief Justice Obedul Hassan. I'm grateful to have been witness to this riveting and thought-provoking conference, and I sincerely hope that this is but the beginning of a sustained dialogue on comparative constitutional law and best practices across borders in and beyond South Asia. Honorable Justice Ubedul Hassan has kindly agreed to celebrate the Supreme Court of India's Foundation Day and he and his gracious spouse visited us 
to celebrate in our own happiness. We are together in times of need and we are in together in times of happiness and celebration as well. He can perhaps relate with my experience when I say that we have a shared legacy of legal and cultural traits that predates our independence. Our judicial traditions are a reflection of these values and I am immensely hopeful that we can only move forward from here. Dialogues such as this conference serve as a reaffirmation of the judicial and legal camaraderie which we share. As the constitutional journeys of India and Bangladesh clocked 75 years and 51 years respectively, it is indeed challenging to compress them into a nutshell without risking generalizations. Even as we talk of these milestones in the context of the democratic and constitutional journeys of Bangladesh and India, I believe their significance can best be appreciated in the context of their origin and evolution. Dialogues and conversations such as this one are significant precisely because they help us contextualize our constitutional histories, find streams of commonalities and divergences, and eventually help us share the learnings. The colonization of the legal systems is the primary imprint of colonial rule. The colonial legal system by its very nature had entrenched graded structural inequality. Our public institutions were then interested in consolidating power more than working for the welfare and the interest of our citizens. The first challenge that we as independent nations faced was to establish a constitutional order premised on the principles of equality and liberty, a constitutional order without any vestiges of colonial legacy. The Government of India Act 1935, the predecessor of the constitutions of India and Bangladesh, set off all of us to a structured and stable start. Constitutions and their longevity turn frequently on their foresight and on the continued relevance of the institutions which they create. While stability is desirable, stability must never be confused with stagnation. We recognize that our constitutions are living documents. The constitutions of Bangladesh and India proclaim that they are given to the people by the people themselves. In that sense, they do make a considerable break from the past. It goes without saying that the founding moments of our constitutions do not only depict a legal trans a transition, they also depict a transition of social and cultural practices. Practices that were steeped in inequality were brought in tune with constitutional values. The doubts about the suitability of constitutions and their stability gradually weakened. When the Indian constitution was born and adopted, people asked, is this constitution going to survive? Bangladesh herself faced trials and tribulations. But the authority of our constitutions came to be accepted not only because of the history of political struggles that preceded the constitution framing processes, but also due to what followed. The adoption of the constitution itself does not eliminate inequality, but it was the start of a gradual yet significant change in our societies. Our constitution recognized our people as rights-bearing citizens rather than subjects of a foreign sovereign power. The constitution established systems of writ issuing courts which are open to anyone with a legitimate grievance. It is a final court of appeal which functioned without the interference of a foreign court or body. Our second challenge as newly independent nations was to restore people's confidence in governments, courts and other public institutions that had come to be synonymous with structures of imperial authority. This is a slow, gradual, and continuing process. Constitutions by their nature are blueprints and not detailed ready reckoners for all contingencies. Constitutions are not like the Income Tax Act. It falls on us to take the constitution to the lives of people who are the source of our authority. The mandate of the courts is effectively met 
if and only if we meaningfully secure the principles that the constitution promises them liberty equality and non discrimination and due process the legitimacy of the institution of governance including the courts is primarily dependent on the functioning of institutions within the limits prescribed by the constitution the confidence of the people in the constitution is in fact only when institutions of governance be it parliament the central investigative agency the election commission or the supreme court rise to the occasion institutions rise to the occasion not in situations which have clear cut answers but in situations of ambiguity and uncertainty the constitution of india recognizes the existing social prejudices in the society and creates frameworks for overcoming them for instance article 15 of our constitution contains the non discrimination clause which prohibits discrimination based only on certain identities such as gender caste caste class place of birth and race in air india versus nargesh mirza in 1983 a law that among other things compelled air hostesses to retire on their first pregnancy was challenged it was argued before the supreme court of india that this was not discriminatory because the basis of the law was not only gender but was also pregnancy and marriage this was evidently to the disadvantage of one gender more than the other however in 1983 the supreme court of india in nargesh mirza's case held that since article 15 prohibited discrimination on grounds only of sex the provision could not be invalidated for violating article 15 yet in nauthe johar versus union of india a judgment in which i also spoke for the supreme court the supreme court overruled nargesh mirza's case our court held that while such classification was based on considerations not prohibited by article 15 expressly such considerations propagate stereotypical norms about gender such laws though facially neutral impacted one group namely women more than the other the court underlined that inequality could not be boxed into neat categories but had to be found in intersections of these categories in doing so it took the opportunity to expand the non discrimination guarantee looking beyond the letter of the law and reaching the spirit of the provision similar to nargesh mirza's case courts in bangladesh have dealt with rules that discriminated against air hostesses based on marriage and pregnancy alongside gender and i refer to the judgments in dalia parveen versus bangladesh biman corporation of the high court division and later in rabia bashri irene versus bangladesh biman corporation the constitutions of india and bangladesh share several similarities in terms of their text and import fundamental rights directive principles of state policy judicial review and the writ jurisdiction of the constitutional courts of the countries are a few among the many common strands unsurprisingly the judicial pronouncements frequently employ analogous principles in enforcing these provisions as i said yesterday the rarest of rare doctrine in death penalty cases the public interest litigation doctrine the basic structure doctrine are a few of the indian supreme court exports that have resonated with our counterparts here in bangladesh i will address these in a while the constitutions of india and bangladesh and i dare say also nepal and sri lanka share another significant similarity they are all given to themselves by the people of the country the constitutional authority as recognized in so no small measure by the preamble is derived from the people of the country by placing the people at the forefront of our constitutional development we recognize the cardinal principle that institutions of governance and the people administering these institutions are accountable to the people it cannot be gainsaid that the people of the country are not a uniform monolith they are a rather complex conglomeration of diverse differently placed individuals the success of constitutions and constitutional courts lies in recognizing the differences in a pluralistic society and addressing them south asian countries the uniquely positioned in their respective post colonial constitutional journeys share various legal and contextual similarities 
A lot of our disputes in areas of gender, representation, access to justice delivery mechanisms, and the rights of the disabled stem from common cultural premises. The legal solutions, therefore, must also be found in similarities. For instance, both Nepal and India have struggled to find solutions against practices such as dowry, which would be unheard of in this exact form elsewhere in the world. In India as well as Bangladesh, we have struggled to find solutions to remedy gender stereotypes and the diminished public participation of women and other marginalized groups. The Constitution of Bangladesh establishes the equality principle in Article 27. Article 28.4 recognizes equality between men and women in all spheres of the state and public life. In Bangladesh, Legal Aid and Services Trust, BLAST versus Bangladesh, the two-finger test in examining the victims of rape was held to be unconstitutional. The Indian Supreme Court in Lilu versus Haryana had similarly found that this test was intrusive, unscientific and undermined the dignity of the victims of rape. I use these instances to demonstrate how two distinct national systems have in their democratic history encountered similar hurdles and attempted to surmount them. In addressing these issues, the courts as bulwarks of constitutional rights have arrived at similar constitutional solutions to these problems. The Indian Supreme Court, through PIL or public interest litigation, has liberalized access to courts by diluting the standards of local standi who can approach the courts. It has appropriately been named social, acti social action litigation in Bangladesh and has been successfully employed to champion public causes such as non-discrimination and environmental preservation. Constitutional developments arrive in one country and around the same time as they do in another. Judges addressing similar problems cannot close their eyes to the opinions of judges who have grappled with them, even if to distinguish their problem from others. A comparative constitutional response is thus the way forward for our similar systems. This is the very thrust of dialogic comparative constitutionalism. Our laws would be better tested regardless of the outcomes. If they are tested against the wider touchstone of jurisprudence stemming from our neighborhood, the object is not mere legal imitation, but to achieve critical dialogue-led self-reflection. The recognition of the public place as a specific site of discrimination, overt and subtle, is significant in our cultural context, both in Bangladesh and in India. It is comparatively easier to spot overt instances of discrimination and exclusionary norms. Our constitutions, though contextualized, retain features of public institutions that were associated with pre-democracy, colonial legacy. The challenge, therefore, before us is to shed antiquated notions of our public institutions, such as our courts, we must, in our policies, as much as in our laws, demonstrate our commitment to inclusion and diversity. Everything from the language of the law to its processes to its infrastructure must reflect this commitment. For instance, unlike in the US and UK, where legislation prohibited women's entry into the bar, India, to the contrary, expressly proscribed and prohibited sex-based disqualification from practice. Cornelia Sorabji, the first woman to practice law in India, and many more like her, still battle gendered perceptions in entering the profession almost entirely dominated by men. Similarly, Bangladesh is also leading from the front, indicating that societies in the global south can be the forerunners of societal change, particularly gender justice. I want to spend just a few moments at this point Forgive me for doing that. And I want to speak about the legal profession. The legal profession traditionally has been male dominated. It has been patriarchal. The spread of legal education has changed the male dominated nature of legal education and profession. More and more parents, more and more young girls are entering the legal profession in India in Bangladesh and in our neighborhood. It has created new avenues for women. Transactional lawyering, for instance, where women don't come to court 
but do their work in structuring transactions both domestic and international have given the place for women because that is where meritocracy is succeeding what we have learned in india is that when you create a level playing field for women women succeed like no other person in our society for example in the new recruitment to the district judiciary in india at the lowest levels namely the civil judge junior divisions over 50% of the new recruits are women coming in on their own merit between 1950 between 1950 and 2024 all of 11 women lawyers were designated as senior counsel by the supreme court of india in the month of february in one go in one go we designated 12 women lawyers as senior counsel i think this is a sign of the changing times bangladesh and india are both countries with a demographic dividend our countries are really young our populations are young and i think as lawyers and judges there's a great deal of expectation from our institutions such as the courts to answer the call of the demographic dividend which we have to do for our societies to advance and prosper now societies are already doing that and it's our duty as judges and lawyers to take that forward the adversarial litigation in india and in bangladesh is a colonial import one person wins and another person loses in the court but then there are alternate forms of dispute resolution which have emerged such as mediation which were the traditional forms of dispute resolution in our societies so it's important that we build on what we have namely our courts but we also encourage our societies to resolve differences peacefully we get a lot of matrimonial disputes in our courts today matrimonial disputes because our societies are changing men and women have become mobile the wife may be based in bangalore the husband may be based in silicon valley in california distance separates and causes problems for a variety of reasons mediation which is voluntary consensual and recognizes party autonomy has been a game changer in resolving disputes peacefully our role as judges is also undergoing a change are we to look upon our role merely as people who decide disputes between a and b that's the core of our function but as judges we also perform the role of being facilitators facilitators for social change in our society our courts owe their existence to a colonial legacy but judges in colonial times performed completely different functions today we are in tandem with society we have to ensure that we look at the needs of our society encourage social growth and social progress by allowing for our marginalized groups to come into the mainstream encourage greater participation of all segments of our society including the most dominant half which is represented by her excellency the prime minister <laughs> finally we must use greater technology both in india and bangladesh as a means of outreach to our citizens i'm always asked with the technology divide with the internet divide even in countries like india is technology only for the elite and my answer is completely to the contrary as part of the e phase the th third phase of the eco e phase sorry the third phase of the e courts project in india the government of india made available 7000 crores a few months ago for the indian judiciary we are using this money to bridge the internet divide we have set up the national judicial data grid which maps every case across india into a judicial data grid we have put forth the digital scr or the supreme court resources the supreme court supreme court reports which is available free of charge not only to indian citizens but to people across the world so that we publicize our own judgments we are setting up e seva kendras in every court and establishment in india so that all our citizens who do not have a smartphone or an android phone can gain access to all the facilities which we uh, as judges and courts have provided in conclusion then 
may i say that a conversation about constitutional developments in south asia is incomplete without access to constitutional courts we must recognize that seemingly basic facilities such as washrooms ramps and appropriate seating in court complexes can be important enablers of access to courts there are other barriers to access as lawyers and judges we are given to believe that our laws and judgments are accessible merely because they are publicly available we must make sure that we as judges and courts learn to communicate to our citizens we have to reach out to our citizens we cannot expect our citizens to reach out to us that represents the changing face of our societies as we aggregate our similarities and identify divergences we must strike a delicate balance we must neither gloss over details nor fixate on them we must use our similarities to examine how distinct national systems have in their democratic history encountered similar hurdles in addressing many issues the courts have found similar constitutional solutions notwithstanding the many similarities our constitutions retain our unique national identities and we respect our national identities the idea of celebrating south asian constitutional developments is not to celebrate unreasoned conformity with the ideals adopted by a particular jurisdiction at the cost of our unique identities while we engage with each other's constitutional experiences we must be wary of confirming certain outcomes simply because they align with our premeditated beliefs the purpose of this engagement over the last two days is not to reaffirm and adopt comfortable conclusions from our neighbors such an exercise would only produce a body of self affirming and uncritical legal norms there may be initial discomfort with engaging with foreign judicial systems similarities that we are trying to trace may seem like forcible imperial attempts to gloss over cultural differences however to my mind the purpose of this conference and the constitution centric engagement is entirely different it is not to obtain homogeneity of outcomes but to have a meaningful even critical conversation about what we can do better mistakes we can avoid and lessons we can learn we can ill afford the comfort of relying solely on inward looking national experiences conferences such as this demonstrate our shared commitment to creating what i believe are learning legal systems legal systems which are always at work always in the service of our people i am confident that conversations such as this will help us appreciate each other's legal systems better and learn from them i thank you very deeply from the bottom of my heart for inviting me jai bangla jai hind